would be able to see the safe from that area. A search of the office revealed a possible clue identifying the time of the murder. We located a note that Carrie was in the process of writing on the top of the note. She had written the date and time. The time was at 2 o'clock in the afternoon. And she was writing the letter to her boyfriend, actually. It was not completed. Carrie's fiancé was quickly ruled out as a suspect. He was over in Wyndham, Minnesota, which is at least uh, a half hour or more away. In fact, he fainted when he got on the phone and learned his fiancé had uh, been murdered. At approximately 2 p.m., there were more than 100 park visitors and employees on site. Investigators learned that Carrie was fearful of one of those employees, Stephen Barber, a 26-year-old maintenance man. Carrie told one of her friends that she felt that Barbara was stalking her and that he just would not leave her alone. Carrie and several co-workers knew that Barbara smoked crack cocaine and was dealing it on the job. Carrie had stated that she was considering talking to the police uh, about uh, possible drug use by this employee. Was it possible that Barbara found out Carrie was about to turn him in? The $2,000 could have been a motive as well. Even more incriminating, Barbara had no alibi for the time of Carrie's murder. how it should work in the modern world. E-shirts, backed by Allstate. Click or call. When some people are pushed, they don't just break, they explode. Time Travel, all new series, Thursday, January 8th at 9, 8 central, only on Investigation Discovery. My beautiful little girl will never come running into my arms again saying, I love you, daddy. Whoever did this must be caught so that they can never do it again. For the medical examiner, it wasn't difficult to determine what happened at the crime scene. There were perfectly round blood drops near both the cash register and the safe. DNA test showed the blood was Carrie's. Carrie could have been struck in the nose with a hand, with another object, and then had a nosebleed, and then as she was being taken into the area where the cash register was, then she was depositing that blood. Small hemorrhages in Carrie's eyes showed that the killer applied force to her neck. I believe were in an effort to control her. I think her clothing and her necklace were used as ligature, and, and then the little hemorrhages occurred as, as that event was happening. The medical examiner found no evidence of sexual assault. The cause of death was blunt force trauma. It appeared that she had been struck with some type of heavy object that had resulted in extensive head and facial injuries that I ultimately showed had led to her death. At Blue Mound State Park, there is only one way in and one way out, and everyone who enters the park is supposed to have a permit. But in a potential setback, investigators learned that the entrance isn't always monitored. There is certainly a possibility that there were people that were in that campground that we didn't know about. The park was isolated. There were hundreds of acres in which the killer could disappear which worried investigators. Campsite located a short distance from the park office. He saw this large white boat type of car uh, leaving the area of the office, going rapidly, spinning its tires. Although he didn't see the car's license plate and couldn't identify the make or model, he did recall when it passed by. 
It was between 2.15 and 2.30 p.m. And Carrie's body was found at 2.44, which put the white car at the scene at the time of the murder. Stephen Barber, the park employee who'd been stalking Carrie before her murder, owned the car that fit this description. Barber owned a white four-door Cadillac that we would describe as a bull leg vehicle. When questioned by police, Barber denied any involvement. He claimed he was at his daughter's birthday party at the time of the murder. Police found nothing in Barber's car or house that tied him to the murder. At the crime scene, next to Carrie's body, was a wristwatch. She's almost literally pointing to it. One end of the leather wristband had been torn off. That certainly suggested that it had come off in the struggle. The watch wasn't Carrie's. Stephen Barber denied owning it, and none of Carrie's co-workers recognized it. Also near Carrie's body was a pack of Doral brand cigarettes. Carrie was not a smoker. We determined that there was no employees at the state park that smoked Doral cigarettes, so therefore we determined that they were most likely left by the suspect. Investigators found no prints on the watch or on the cigarette pack. So forensic technicians used heated super glue in the office, which releases vapors that adhere to the amino acids in fingerprints. It was a fairly monumental task because obviously with that large number of people coming through that agency, uh, there would have been a, a, a tremendous amount of fingerprints left on various surfaces. With this technique, investigators found 135 latent prints. None of those prints matched their suspect, Stephen Barber. Scientists also swabbed the watch found next to Carrie's body. They found a mixture of three different DNA profiles. One was Carrie Nelson's, probably a result of her pulling the watch off of the perpetrator. Neither of the other two profiles matched the DNA of Stephen Barber. We really felt Barber was our man, and all of a sudden the forensic evidence starts coming back and saying this is not him. Investigators were finding forensic evidence. They just didn't have a suspect to compare it to.